Thank you all uh, uh, for coming uh, today. Uh, and uh, it's really nice to see this big crowd. Uh, um, Professor Richard was uh, saying that uh, perhaps it's for the good food that people come. I said, no, it's the food for thought that they come. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, a really a, a distinct pleasure to welcome Jan Richard, one of the uh, <coughs> prominent, most prominent um, uh, historians and uh, social scientists of uh, modern Iran. Uh, anybody who is in this field uh, is very familiar with uh, his work. And, uh, and really, we don't need that much of a, an introduction. But uh, as uh, the tradition goes, we start with a little uh, introduction. Uh, yeah, first, uh, Richard was born in uh, uh, France, uh, Burgundy, and studied uh, philosophy uh, and uh, linguistics, and traveled to Iran uh, for the first time in 1970 and 72. Uh, and uh, like anybody else who travels to Iran, uh, he fell in love with uh, Persian poetry and, uh, and uh, philosophy. Uh, and uh, he taught language in, in uh, Tehran for that period, um, and then went back uh, to Tübingen in Germany, uh, and uh, and uh, and then Paris uh, to work on a dissertation, uh, PhD uh, research on uh, Abdul Razak Lahiji, um, which uh, is very close to my heart <coughs> because he comes from the region my family is from. Lahiji. Really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's uh, one of the uh, prominent students of Mullah Sadra, if those of you who are familiar with uh, Iranian uh, Islamic philosophy. <coughs> um, uh, like all other philosophers, he was also a poet. And I wanted to read this little poem, since you started with poetry, of uh, Abdul Razak Lahiji. Oh, yes, he has uh, a divan, of divan course. Yes. And he says that I'll just read it in Farsi and uh, won't translate it. هر دل که هوای عالم راز کند هر دل که هوای عالم راز کند باید گره علاقه را باز کند دام است تعلقات دنیا دام است در دام چگونه مرغ پرواز کند بیوتیفول <laughs> Richard went back to Iran in 1975, and, and unlike so many others who left Iran with the first signs of the uh, Iranian revolution, he stayed in Iran until 1981. So he also is a sort of first-hand witness of the revolutionary movement uh, in Iran, and um, and went back to uh, uh, to uh, Paris after 1981, and uh, began to work on his. Uh, uh, Habilitation Schrift, as the Germans give it. Uh, yes. Uh, and um, and uh, was appointed uh, after finishing the second dissertation, as we know in English, uh, as a uh, professor of uh, Iranian studies at uh, Sorbonne Nouvelle. He has produced a large body of uh, work, uh, mostly in French, uh, but some of that work is also translated into Persian and some into English. Uh, the most recent one is this book, which is available as site for purchase. Uh, my only regret about this book uh, is that it was not available when I was putting together my syllabus for this semester on modern Iran. Uh, and I had the opportunity to, to read the book. And, and this is a really a wonderful introduction uh, uh, to this a uh, 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 flyer for discount if oh, somebody. Twenty yeah. percent <laughs> discount. You, you just mentioned when you are purchasing the book, you just mentioned Jan Richard, and this is a discount. Uh, and um, uh, but the book is uh, uh, a, a fantastic journey through uh, late Qajar period and and uh, 20th century Iran. Uh, for those of you who teach or are interested in Iranian history, this book is. It would be a fantastic uh, source book for you. Uh, I also would like to mention uh, two interesting uh, 
uh, edited, annotated uh, books uh, that the publishers uh, put together and came out a few years ago. Uh, and uh, one is the uh, memoirs of Edmund uh, T.J. Edmonds, the British uh, political officer. Uh, and uh, these memoirs, uh, his uh, engagement uh, is post uh, First World War in, uh, in, uh, in Iraq, in Kurdistan, in Iran. Uh, and uh, it's a fascinating account of his uh, involvement in new forms of state building and negotiation with two different kind of uh, political uh, actors in the region. And the other one, uh, which is uh, unfortunately I have not read, uh, uh, and uh, it's going to be translated soon in, in, uh, in, in Farsi. In Persian, yes. In Persian, and uh, and uh, it's a two. Uh, uh, eyewitness accounts, uh, the French eyewitness accounts of the 1921 coup that eventually brought the Reza Shah and Pahlavi dynasty to power. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's quite significant because this is a French, uh, they're not that directly involved in this uh, uh, transformations at the time, but it would be a really interesting thing. I'm just quite curious to see how these eyewitness accounts uh, uh, play out. So um, yeah, uh, this is also our last event for the for this semester, and I'm really glad that we are ending it with a big bang uh, our uh, series uh, for this semester. And without further ado, please help me to welcome Professor Yang Wei. I applaud to your speech. Uh, you said very nice things and not worthy of them. I thank. Uh, I thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very honored that so many people came uh, and give me the opportunity to present my book here in Princeton. Actually, I put a very sexy title to the talk, Plots, Secrets, Truth, and Lies in Modern Iranian Historiography. And I was uh, uh, at the beginning of the week in Yale. Uh, Abbas Amonat complained about my title here. He said, uh, we could have gathered more, much more, m many people, uh, many more people in, in Yale if you had put a, such a title to, to us. Uh, and, uh, well, I don't know what I'm going to, to uh, make understood uh, of my intention by this title, but uh, I just begin with a, a, a small thing. Uh, in a recent book on Ahmad Fadid, there is a contribution by Abbas Amonat, who is the prominent historian of modern Iran. And he begins by saying, what I'm going to say about Fadid is my own memory. It is a, a very fragile uh, document because it is very subjective. I cannot attest that all what I remember about Fadid uh, has the value of a historical document. And uh, I think most of the documents which we use to write the history of countries like Iran, I think Iran is not unique and many things what I'm going to, to say now could be uh, uh, valid for other countries as well. I think some of the items I will discuss in my uh, presentation might be very special to Iran, and uh, I would be happy if you have questions and if we have a dialogue afterwards. All for me begins a bit like what uh, Behruz has very nicely uh, presented at the beginning. That begins in Iran, where I was not uh, in Iran to make research on history, but to make research on philosophy. And then came this big event which nobody had, had foreseen. Even an historian like Nikki Keddy uh, or you know, any specialist of Iran, they, nobody could have uh, seen, could have uh, thought that Iran was going to, to have such an experience. And I was there. I knew a person. I had many friends. And I read what was coming out, I was trying to understand, and I 
uh, if you excuse me, I took part in the demonstrations, in, in most of the revolutionary demonstrations, not as a leader, not as agent, but as somebody who was in tune with what was happening. And then I was there after the revolution when the new regime uh, took shape, when it gave itself a constitution, when the uh, crisis, the hostage crisis came out. And uh, at the end I came back, uh, I was asked what happened. And I, I was unable to understand myself, what, what I had experienced. So all my uh, academic life after this revolution is uh, up to now uh, focused on the revolution. How can we understand what had just happened in front of our eyes? The first uh, research which I began was directed towards uh, Shiite Islam because I had studied basic uh, notions of Shiite Islam with Corbin, Henri Corbin, and for my dissertation on Islamic philosophy, I was due to have some basic knowledge of Islamology. So I began with the sociology of uh, Shiite Islam, which entailed in a, a book, uh, somebody has a, the book here, uh, which was eventually translated into English in 1995, Shiite Islam. And uh, in that book, I tried to understand not what Shiite Islam is in itself. This was a, a critique which I had from Patricia Croner, for example, and I turned it down by saying I, I'm not so much interested in saying what is Islam, Shiite Islam. Uh, maybe the Islamic theologians could say better than I, Modar Recita Botaboyi, and those people who have been trained to, to explain what Islam is. But I, I want to say, to say what Iranians and what Shiites uh, believe in. What, what are the creeds of, what are the beliefs of uh, Shiite uh, Muslims? And in which way the ideological trends which we can uh, witness uh, from the begin, from the, the end of the 19th century, uh, in which way do they enter in uh, communication with the, the basic beliefs of Shiites. Uh, and here I met a very interesting question uh, when I read the book of uh, uh, an anthropologist called Reinhard Loeffler, an, an Austrian anthropologist, very interesting book and very controversial called Islam in Practice, Religious Beliefs in a Persian Village. It uh, came out in 88 in, at Sunny Press. And uh, Le Fleur made extensive research in Yasuj, a small town near Shiraz in the south of Iran. He doesn't name the, the, the town in his book, to, not to annoy the people, but he, the research was done there. He went to Yasuj for rather long periods, one or two months, uh, from uh, the beginning of the 1970s and after the revolution again. And he would speak with people and ask them what they believe in. And he put that together in a book. And individually, he describes what every of his informants have told him about the religious creed. And the result is very striking. He says at the end, I, I just sum it up with a formula, Islam does not exist. You have as many Islamic creeds, Islamic beliefs, as you have Islamic believers. Nobody believes in the same things. Some are uh, praying the angels, some are praying the, the imams, some are praying uh, God, some are, you know, uh, believe in uh, uh, the, uh, the life after, after death and so forth. 
the, uh, each one has a different explanation and each one has a different religion. And I was just asking myself, if you would have went to a, have, have gone to a, 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 the church on Sunday morning after the, the, the mass or the, the Sunday prayers, uh, and ask every Christian coming out of church what he believes in, I think he would have had similar results. And the, here, I must say, I'm not, absolutely not uh, in agreement with Loeffler. I think there is a religion, because those individuals uh, who were his informants, they also go to the mosque. They, uh, I think most of them would uh, say their Muslim prayers uh, three times a day like the Shiites do. And they would mostly listen to the ulama, to the, to the clerics when they uh, make uh, predications in the mosque or in uh, Muslim gatherings. So there is a sort of mediation which gives religion a sort of existence outside individuals. And this is a, a, a very important point because when I was making my research on the sociology of Shiite Islam, I had discussions with uh, Farhad Khosrokhavar, whom some of you may know from his writings, or I think he was in the US for a while, maybe he has been here, I don't know. And Farhad Khosrow Khavar made a very interesting research uh, during and after, immediately after the revolution, which came out as a book with a, a French sociologist, uh, uh, Vieille, uh, what's his name? Uh, Vin no, no, Vieille, with Vieille, Paul Vieille, Paul Vieille. And uh, the book is called Le, le discours populaire de la révolution iranienne, the, the popular discourse of the Iranian revolution. And what Khosrow Khavar objected to me was, uh, you are listening to what the mullahs or the intellectuals say about Islam, and it, I, I go directly to the popular discourse, and I give you an image of what people uh, the, ba the, the basis of the society, people who are not literate, who illiterate people think what they, how they behave, how they, what they believe in, what is the idea about the revolution. And this is completely different. I object to his work, again, that uh, he is a mediator to take out from what he has heard, what he has recorded, to take out something which has a meaning. And we need a, a mediator. And the ulama or the intellectuals, in a way, are each one mediators to give us some interpretation of what is expected by people in religion or in the revolution. And if we don't have this articulated discourse, which comes out uh, a sort of informal uh, uh, awaiting from the, the uh, popular uh, classes, if we don't have this, we cannot pretend, we cannot claim to have direct access to the popular discourse. I think the popular discourse does not exist. It is a, an intellectual dream you, you think you, you, you will be better than the others and you will go and bring, a, bring up uh, what comes out of uh, popular discourse, but th there is nothing like that. And when an intellectual speaks, he has different level of discussions and he tries to be in tune with, with the expectation of the people. Otherwise, his discourse has no value. And it, it's exactly the same for a mullah. And here, I propose to consider the mullahs as intellectuals. Maybe some, some of you will be very unhappy with this description of the clerical work, but 
in a way, you know, an intellectual is somebody who brings new central values to the society. Uh, as a mullah only repeats what he has learned in the madrasa, in the, the seminary, he would not be considered as a, an intellectual. But when he is confronted with a new situation, like the Islamic revolution, and he is obliged to give answers which were not pre-prepared uh, in, in, the, in the Islamic tradition, but he, he needs to answer now to modern problems, social problems, cultural problems, the encounter with uh, imperialism, with new societies, with uh, uh, social issues. In this term, uh, the Mullah acts like an intellectual. His discourse bega begins to be a reference to which uh, people can identify themselves or, on the contrary, they can react against it. In that term, I think the mullahs are, are intellectual. And this is what I have argued in a research which we did with Gilles Keppel. Uh, and I uh, brought out some examples in the history of modern Iran of religious theologians, religious clerics, who are considered rightly or falsely, I don't know, I'm not, you know, I'm not a judge here, I, I just look at what I see coming out. And I, one example I, I can give you now is the, the example of Fazlullah Nouri, a high-ranking theologian who was a reactionary. He was against the re revolutionary movement at the beginning of the 20th century. 1906-1909, but at the beginning he did not oppose frontly to the revolution. He, he worked with them, he accepted to discuss his ideas, and actually he had some influence in the supplement of the 1907 uh, con constitution, uh, where the, the Article 2, where the clergy uh, has a role, even in this secular-minded constitution, the clergy has a role to uh, make uh, censorship over the decisions of the parliament. And Fazlullah Nouri eventually turned to be against the, uh, the revolutionaries and he, he sided with Muhammad Ali Shah and he was executed in the public square of Tehran after a judgment. He has been judged, condemned to death and executed in 1909. And his, uh, his discourse is considered generally as a reactionary discourse, uh, opposed to reforms, opposed to progress. And uh, if you read Kasravi or other common uh, Iranian historians, they would all have a negative approach of him. And you must wait until the 1960s when a grandson of uh, Fazlullah Nouri, uh, Tondar Kia, wrote a very moving biography of him, saying he was resisting the influence of imperial powers like the Russians and the, the British, and he wanted to defend the Iranian identity against foreign encroachment. And this has been taken over by a very popular intellectual of the 1960s who had been a Marxist and who turned to be a, a sort of a, a popular uh, sociologist, uh, Al Ahmad, he died in 1969, uh, who gave a very striking picture of Fazlullah Nouri uh, as defender of national identity against the Western uh, influence. And in the same book, I think it's that Khidmat Vakhyonat Roshan Fikran. In the same book, Ali Ahmad <coughs> has a very moving uh, section about Khomeini, who was 
already known since 1963-1964 as somebody who had opposed the reforms of the Shah, and especially in, 19, in October 1964, when he opposed what uh, Khomeini had called the return of the capitulations. It means the new law protecting the American military personnel in Iran under the privilege of extraterritoriality. So if there was any conflict or any uh, <coughs> problem with an American, even the family of the milita military personnel, uh, he would, the, the American would not be judged uh, before uh, an Iranian court but before a consular court or even judge only in the United States, which uh, was <coughs> impossible to accept for a nationalist. And this is something which has uh, been very important in my reading of the uh, Shiite uh, ideological movement to discover that the roots of the upheaval, the roots of the ideology, is to be taken from very ancient griefs against uh, uh, Western encroachments. And my next <coughs> studies were uh, more on social and political history of Iran. We, uh, in, in Paris, we, with two colleagues of mine, Jean-Pierre Degas and Bernard Hourcade, we uh, wrote together a book called L'Iran au XXe siècle, Iran in the 20th century, which was a bit uh, frustrating for me. Not that I would not be in tune with my colleagues, but uh, for two reasons. The first is that the publisher, of course, wanted us to make a book which was readable by a large readership, by people who are not specialists, who could not, uh, we, we, we were invited not to refer to too many German or Russian titles, to uh, limit ourselves with uh, French or English titles in the bibliography, for example and no Iranian title. So we, uh, n to, not to, uh, to put the, the reader in a strange position saying, well, those people are writing only for specialists who can read Persian, so it's not for us. And then the second, uh, the, the, this first frustration entailed in a very tough discussion with a, an Iranian researcher at the French uh, Institute of the Sorbonne Nouvelle. Uh, he came to me when the book came out he, and he said, how dare you speak about Iranian contemporary history society and you don't quote any work by Iranian authors, by Iranian researchers. Can you uh, justify this? It is incredible. I cannot accept your attitude. And he was very harsh, very tough in his critique. And I tried to, uh, to calm him down and said that the publisher didn't want us to put too many uh, scholarly references in the book because it's, it was for a large readership and we didn't want to take people out of the readership. And uh, after that, I just thought, he was right. He was right. We, how can we dare? And you, you look at most of the books which come out in the US on the history or on the society of Iran, you see scarcely reference to uh, Persian material, Persian sources, secondary sources, or even primary, because they, they are afraid of uh, being, either they are afraid of being too scholarly, or in some cases, I don't want to give names here, but I, in some cases, I, I know that the authors don't know rightly Persian, and they, they read Persian with so many difficulties that they, they don't 
you know, if something is not translated for them, or is not already published in translation, they won't use it. And most of the works written by Iranians are, of course, not translated. They are in Persian. So I decided this guy was right, and I would not anymore address a Western audience without taking in consideration that an Iranian must find his own bread in what I am giving him, his own uh, uh, expectations. The other frustration which I had in that book is that we decided to make it Iran in the 20th century, like many books which are available in the West about Iran, because you, know, you don't want to go too far back. But uh, I thought the constitutional revolution is uh, already an achievement of uh, several movements and several reactions of the Iranians uh, confronted with uh, Western or Russian, we consider the Russians as Western, Western encroachments. And without going back, at least to the beginning of the Qajar, you won't understand what is at stake. And especially in the case of the uh, speech of Khomeini and the capitulations, uh, what is the capitulation problem? If you don't go back to the second war of Iranians against the Russians and the Treaty of Turkmanshah in 1828, you won't be able to understand what has scratched the mind of uh, Iranian nationalists for 100 years. The capitulations have been only abolished in Iran in 1928 by Reza Shah. Very late very lately. And the Western diplomats would all complain about Reza Shah uh, suppressing the capitulations because it was very comfortable for them. They didn't risk to be trialed, uh, tried uh, in, in uh, Iranian courts, even after the takeover of this new dynasty where the, the framework was more secular than before. So I decided to go back to the beginning of the Qajars and to try to understand how did all these uh, political and religious movements mixed together, how did they confront it uh, with the new uh, challenge of Western powers and uh, how they, they had a sort of alliance. Uh, I don't want to, to make a complete survey of my book here, of the history of Iran in two centuries. But you, you had, for example, a major religious movement, movement which was challenging both uh, the monarchy and the clerical establishment in the middle of the 19th century, the Babi movement. And if you don't see what happened then, what were the expectations of people who uh, were behind the, the Bab and be, who became Babis, and then those who became Baha'is later, uh, it's difficult to understand uh, how the ulama in Iran, the clerics, uh, made a sort of political alliance with the monarchy until the end when they saw that social movements against the encroachments of the West needed to be uh, sided with uh, clerical support. And this was the tobacco movement, which was a major stage in uh, the uh, commitment of the ulama into the political sphere. And uh, then we, we go, we, we have uh, very original movements in this uh, period of Iran, in the late Qajar period, 
when uh, Sayyid Jamal Asadabadi, whom mostly the Western call Ab Al Afghani, uh, came out with a new vision of Islam as a force to resist the encroachment of imperial powers. And his views was to unite Sunnites and Shiites together, maybe behind the Sultan of Istanbul, uh, to resist the influence of the British, of the Russians, uh, which was threatening all the Islamic world. And, uh, you know, from Iran came very original forces. And then you understand in other eyes what happened in the constitutional revolution, where it seems that the, the Western influence was dominating. Even many of the clerics accepted to make a compromise with the secular intellectuals and uh, reformists. And this compromise ended up with the execution of Sheikh Fazlullah in July 1909. You know, uh, to see the, the, the prominent figure of the clerical establishment executed in the public square of Tehran is really a shock. And this was the end of the collaboration between the, uh, the clerics and the reformists. We, we go afterwards into very interesting uh, stages of uh, relations between religion and politics. And uh, if I want to answer some of the uh, expectations which you may have about my sexy title at the beginning, I, I must speak about two major events which changed the fate of Iranian politics, 1921 and 1953. And uh, here my concern is what do we know about these two coups? Do we know really what was happening, what has happened, what, what is? I claim against uh, the majority of Iranian intellectuals even today that this was not a simple foreign uh, intervention because it is the, the, to, to make all th things uh, caused by uh, a foreign plot is a too simple solution. Concerning the 1921 coup, we have very few sources, primary sources, except the British one. And this is a major issue of the Iranian historiography of modern times. It is that we have very scarce uh, Iranian archives, Iranian primary documents, and usually the historians go to London, to Kew Gardens. It was called beforehand the Public Record Office, and now it's, it's called the National Archives. Uh, very well organized. You don't want to make, to bother, you know, to, to whether you would be able to find the document you're looking for. You go there, you have a reader's ticket very quickly, and after half an hour, you have the document you are looking for in front of you. And all the documents which you would expect to explain to you what was happening in Iran behind the curtain. Because naturally, of course, all was in the hands of the British. So think many Iranians even today. So you, you have the explanation. The British were all everywhere. They had information about everything, about society, about e economy, about polit political life. And uh, you have the, all the features of a dependent Iran here in these archives. It, uh, of course, it, it would be too simple if it were like that. One of my 
brighter students, Oliver Bast, who is now, who is now my successor at the Sorbonne Nouvelle, uh, a German historian, went to Iran and made research on Iran in that period, the period of the coup after the First World War, and especially on uh, the most despised, the most contempted politician of this time, Vosur Dole, Hassan Vosur Dole, a very bright politician, but if you go to British sources and of course to the Iranian sources who are fueled with the British documents, you would, you would only see a negative uh, description of Vosur Dole. He was corrupt. He was stupid, he was betraying his country, and he was un uh, unable to run the country. But Oliver Bast went to Iran with the idea, I don't want to go to the PRO before. I go to the Iranian archives. I go to the Iranian sources available. There are some. And he found very interesting things. For example, Vosur Dole had three important moves which were completely independent and even against the, the will of the British. So the, the historiographers uh, of today have just in mind uh, the 1919 agreement with the British which, which was never implemented because there was a huge resistance against it, first from the French and the Americans and then from the popular opinion, from the intellectuals. But they forget the three things which Oliver Bast had found, has found out. I just give them very quickly here. One was sending a delegation to the Versailles Conference after the First World War. You know that all the negotiations took place in, in Versailles, uh, in the very place where uh, the French had capitulated against the, uh, the Germans in uh, 1871, so it was symbolically uh, a place to humiliate the Germans. And there in Versailles, uh, the Western powers did not want to accept uh, any Iranian delegation, saying the Iranians have always tried to work with the Germans and the Ottomans during the war, and they, they will not be accepted. They have not sided with us, they declared themselves neutral, except in the last year of the, of the war, and we don't accept the presence here. But they did lobby for Iran in the month of the negotiations. Uh, the second move was to send a delegation to Caucasus, especially to Armenia and Georgia, to establish new links with those places where the Iranians were still dreaming of going back after having been uh, pushed out from uh, Caucasus by, by the Russian uh, in uh, 1813 and 1830, 1828, the two wars which Iranian uh, lost against the, the Russians. So the, the dream of going back to Caucasus. And this delegation, very interesting delegation, was headed by Sayyid Ziauddin, actually the, the person who uh, did the coup with Reza Khan in 1921. And when they went back to Iran after very great projects of unions and uh, 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 commercial agreements and so forth, the Soviets took over in Caucasus, and so the, all the result of this delegation was null, but it had uh, happened. And the third thing was to send a delegation, Moshaver al Mamolek, to Moscow to negotiate directly with the Russians. The Russians were intervening in northern Iran, so uh, with, with the Jangal movement, and uh, you know. Iranians had some initiatives which did not come from the British, and this was Vosur Dole. So we, we must reevaluate all our vision of Iran 
outside uh, the, 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 the site of the uh, British diplomats who were writing extensively on Iran, but the uh, reports were oriented towards justifying British presence, British power, British imperialism, saying the Iranians are unable to govern themselves. We must be there. This was the, you know, all the, uh, the sense of the British reports. In the 1921 coup, we have three major versions. One, the most quoted by Iranians today, is taken from the diaries of uh, General Aaron Ironside, who was sent to Iran some months before the coup in October 1920, and who, pre who claims in, in his diaries that, uh, in a way, he was the man who has organized all the things. He has chosen Reza Khan uh, in, uh, among the, the Cossacks. And, and uh, he gives a apparently reliable version of what happened. So the Iranians would say, look, this is the British. They sent a general. This general made a deal with Reza Khan, and eventually Reza Khan became the leader of the new uh, government. The second version is that of Reza Khan himself. We have not much of Reza Khan, but we know that he was a nationalist in character, and he had tried beforehand uh, well, to, to take out uh, Colonel Clergy out of the Cossack brigade, he, even with the help of a foreign legation. So he was, he was not reluctant about having some external help for a nationalist movement, because in, in 1917, uh, he had actually contacts with the German legation to try to have the Germans on his side against this uh, uh, crypto-communist uh, uh, Russian officer in the, uh, in the Cossack Brigade. And in, in this uh, coup, Reza Khan, who never spoke of Seyyed Ziya as the leader of the coup, uh, he, he would just present himself as the man who wanted to restore national sovereignty all over Iran. So he, you know, if you look at the, the speeches Reza Khan had long after that, just uh, presenting himself, he, uh, Sayyid Ziya did not exist anymore. And the British, you will never see the name of any British officer, any British help. Not Smyth, not Ironside, none of these guys. The third report, the third source, which came out only after the Islamic Revolution, in a very tricky article uh, by uh, Jamal Zadeh, the famous writer who died in 1997. He, he was 105 when he died. Uh, and in his last years, uh, even in, in the years of the revolution, he, he was afraid of having maybe the Islamic Republic sending somebody to kill him in Geneva. He was living in Geneva. So he was very careful. He made statements of uh, support for Khomeini. And he said, I was always for Khomeini, all my life. <laughs> and in fact, he was an Azali. He was the son of an Azali preacher uh, who was uh, killed in 1909, uh, 1908, I'm sorry. And uh, he, he, uh, Azali means. Uh, he was, in, re, in fact, he was not a Muslim. He was, uh, you know, in, in a different religious framework. But I mean, I have nothing to, to do with that. This man who was living in Geneva in the 1930s had the visit of Seyyed Ziya, who went into exile after uh, he had briefly been the prime minister of Iran, 
remained only three months in office. And Sayed Zia went to Montreux uh, in, n near G Geneva. And uh, he had, at the beginning, uh, good means of living. He was living in a hotel. And he thought he was going back uh, as a uh, victorious uh, politician uh, uh, taking Reza Shah uh, or Reza Khan out of his uh, office and taking his place. But this did not happen. So he was very un uh, unpleased with what ha was happening. And he wanted to, to record his, me his own memories of the coup. And this is very interesting because uh, he has a detailed uh, uh, story which begins with his mission to Caucasus, which I just uh, arranged before, beforehand. And uh, eventually, in Caucasus, he had two friends who were gendarmerie <coughs> officers and who uh, came out to be in Razvin collaborating with Ironside. And those who have chosen Reza Khan, in fact, are not uh, is not the, the British Ironside who didn't know anything about Iran before he came in October 1920. But it was these two officers, friends of Sayyid Zia, who advised uh, Ironside to invite Reza Khan, who was a very powerful uh, officer in the Cossack Brigade, invite him to make something out to restore order in Iran. And then the British could go out in peace and go back to Iraq where they were confronted with major upheavals. In any case, what is very striking is that, OK, I have only one, one hour left, he says, yes. so it's, it's OK. <laughs> it, it is very striking that Sayyid Ziya never tells the name of Ironside in his uh, report. Never, never. We don't. Uh, they don't exist. The British don't exist. And we, we know that he was an Anglophile. In, in any case. So these three different versions of the coup of, by people who, are, who had surely a major role in it are incompatible with one another. And even we don't know when Sayyid Ziya and Reza Khan, the two major politicians who took over on the 21st February of 1921. We don't know when they met the first time. I think they just met on the eve of the coup. They have never met before, which is very striking. How could that happen? And actually, they were very soon in disagreement. And Reza Khan, who was stronger, got rid of Sayyid Zia after three months. I just go very quickly to the 1953 coup against Mossadegh. And this concerns the Americans, because uh, the CIA has a very interesting report by Wilbur, uh, written some month after the coup, in August 1953. Uh, and in this report, which was only released in 2000, and first it was released without the uh, name of the persons collaborating with the CIA in, in Tehran. And then eventually we have all the report, the original form, which is all on the internet. And uh, this has been even quoted by uh, officials of the United States, President Obama, in his famous Cairo speech, uh, made official excuses of the US for what they've done in 1953, and uh, trying to get the Iranian opinion uh, again uh, in its side. And what is uh, very interesting is that an Iranian historian is not is like me is not a professional historian is somebody who has existential questions about the history of Iran and an Iranian historian living in the West living in uh, Geneva 
or in Montreux, maybe in Montreux, exactly what the idea was, uh, has published a very interesting book, Iran and the CIA, where he, he checks uh, the details of the Wilbur report, and he says, uh, you know, on the 16th of August 1953, the coup had failed. Uh, Colonel Nassiri, who brought to Mossadegh uh, the farman of the Shah uh, to uh, say that he was no more the prime minister, Nassiri was arrested because Mossadegh had been informed of what Nassiri was, uh, why, why was Nassiri coming to him. So Nassiri was arrested before he gave the uh, Shah's order to him. And uh, the Shah, uh, learning that Nasiri had been arrested, uh, took his own play, airplane and went to Baghdad and then to Rome. So the Shah flew uh, out of the country. And the coup was a failure. And from Nicosia, where the CIA had its headquarters, uh, they gave the order to all agents in Iran to get away from Iran as soon as is possible. They could not go away immediately because all was in complete turmoil. And the next day, the communists demonstrated in the streets of Tehran, chanting slogans for a communist republic and turning down the statues of the Shah and of his father. And the next day, you have the army coming to the streets with tanks, with the support of large uh, masses of people who were mobili mobilized against Mossadegh, who chanted slogans against Mossadegh. And this is very interesting. Who was behind the victory of the coup two days or three days after uh, the uh, CIA authorities considered the coup a failure. It was, according to Bayandor, and I'm very close to his point of view, it was the Mullahs who wanted the Shah to be back. And there is a well-known sentence attributed, well, there is no proof of that, but Bayandor says he has personal sources. We have some indirect uh, confirmation of it in the memoirs of Montazeri, who was with uh, Ayatollah Mon Burujerdi in that time near Rome. It was in summer, and Burujerdi was in uh, Ojnouye. Uh, Burujerdi, who did not intervene in politics at all, when hearing the news that the communists were going to take over in Tehran, he just said one sentence, Mamlekat Shah Mifahat, the country needs a sovereign, needs a monarch. And eventually people, by hearing what the reaction of their religious leader, went to uh, attack the Musabiris forces and to uh, uh, savage, uh, or you know, turn down the, the house of Mossadegh and uh, burn out all the documents of his uh, government for three years. And eventually the Shah came back in a, an American flight. That the Iranian opinion would attribute the coup to the American is not completely false because the American had invested and they had prepared something and they have some responsibility in the coup, of course. But the Mullahs have the decisive uh, action against Mossadegh at the end. And this is something which the Islamic Republic cannot openly say, because they don't like Mossadegh. They, take out, they took out the names which the people wanted to put on big streets, for example, in Tehran. Uh, a big street was called Mossadegh Avenue, 
and they, it was uh, uh, taken out by the, the mullahs because they don't like Khomeini. They don't like uh, Mossad there. And, but they, they can't say that we had the responsibility of toppling, topping Mossad there from uh, its office in 1953. They don't want it to be said openly. So they attribute it very uh, comfortably to, to the Americans, and they made, uh, uh, you know, they make it uh, an American historical mistake. Uh, it's easier for them. What I want to say here is that my role in being a self-made historian of modern Iran is very uncomfortable because the uh, nationalist feelings in, among, among the Iranian intellectuals, and especially in the field of history, is very strong, very high. And it is very difficult for Iranians today, if I tell them, look, the 1921 coup was not done by the British. It was done by two Iranians with the help of the, of the British. Most Iranians would not believe me. You know, it is, for them, it is not acceptable. But now I, I think I can say it with more proof because I have found documents and evidence of what I'm saying. And in 1953, it's the same. If I say the, the mullahs are responsible, maybe people who are pro-Mossad there would not like the mullahs, but they, they would say, no, it is the Americans. It is the Americans. It must come from outside. And here I just respond to them. A very uh, interesting sentence by a great Iranian poet of the 20th century, Muhammad Tari Bahar, who said, Azmos ke barmos. What comes on us is from us. And this is a point which has been a bit developed in my book through the help, I must say, of Willem Flor, who, uh, when I was tempted to uh, give the responsibility of uh, big uh, negative experiences of the Iranians in the two last centuries, he would tell me, look, the, you have Iranians who were collaborating with the Russians, who were collaborating with the British. You have uh, an Iranian latifundist class, you know, uh, great landowners who were exploiting their own people and who were uh, starving their people, hoarding uh, uh, corn, uh, be, uh, waiting for the prices to go up and so forth, and having advantages from the misery of their own people. So don't forget that Iranians are responsible uh, for their own fate. And this is my answer, and I finish with that to a, a good friend of mine who is a good researcher, an Iranian living in Paris, and who wrote a very interesting book on the coup of 1953, uh, uh, Ali Rahnemar. His interpretation is that the Americans have done everything from the beginning to the end. I cannot accept that. No. The Iranians have also a sort of responsibility in this failure. Thank you very much.